Okay. <laughs> Hi everyone. Great to have so many people. And my name's Jenny Pollock and I've been involved in teaching astronomy for many years. And I'm at the moment I'm chairperson of the I'm a retired teacher of Earth and Space Science and Sciences and um, I'm also a companion of the Royal Society and I've uh, um, chairperson of Earth and Space Science, which is where astronomy is mostly taught at uh, senior level, NCA um, levels one, two, and three. But today I'm going to particularly just show you kind of the scope of uh, what can be taught at an astronomy education um, from years one to 10, and also show you relevant curriculum um, links so that you can get all your documentation okay but then just give you a whole heap of ideas. And so what I've got is a PowerPoint that gives a whole series of snapshots, which I will talk to, and then I will pause at the end of each slide and uh, see if anyone wants to ask anything. And if not, I will just go on and go on to the next one. The, that, the PowerPoint is online. I've only added a little bit of, um, to one slide. Uh, since I put it online about an hour ago. And but there's also a big document which has got all the curriculum links in full. And it's also got different aspects of astronomy and how you can expand that and activities that you could do. I didn't have time to put that into year levels because any of those exercises, any of those things can be made quite simple for junior students and made more complex for more senior students, um, so it can be readily adapted to whatever your group of students are for. I'd start particularly to planetary science, our solar system. I haven't gone too much into stars and galaxies and stuff like that for reasons that I'll explain as we go through the PowerPoint. Also, just due, due to sheer lack of time, it took a lot, quite a lot of time to put the document together anyway, in a very pleasurable way, but I just didn't have time to start expanding the stars and the galaxy stuff as well. So, yeah, okay, any questions at this point? Otherwise, I'll get started on the um, PowerPoint. Okay. Oh, I, I came across the word quasar the other day, and I don't understand what it is. And it's a um, quasars from memory. I haven't read about them for a while, but they're incredibly bright, highly magnetic, highly energetic, kind of enormous stars that tend to be found a sort of a, more at the edges of the universe. I'm not. I think that's a reasonably accurate um, description, um, but there's always good old Mr. Google or Mrs. Google if you can't. If, that, if you need something fuller than that. Okay, so I'll, I'll start the PowerPoint and uh, uh, right, there we are. So this is astronomy in the classroom. And this is a wonderful picture taken by Ian Griffin, who runs the Otago Museum down south and is an astrophysicist and a very well-known internationally astronomer. So New Zealand's very lucky to have him. And I don't know whether you can actually see, and I don't know whether people see my mouse, but can you see the Kiwi in the Milky Way? I don't know if people can see that, but that's actually the, um, I never realized that actually existed until quite a long time ago, but we, until a few, um, a few months ago, but we, we see that from the Southern um, Hemisphere, the zodiacal, um, Kiwi that it's called. So that's actually quite cool. Okay, so just carrying on, and I've used that um, the background of all my slides. So there's just a general thing about teaching astronomy and also how it can be one, made wonderfully um, cross curricular. So I'll just give you a minute to read that. Uh, any questions? No, I okay, can't. On, on that slide, yeah. Just above the comma with planets on almost the bottom line, is that a um, meteorite? That, that there's a sort of streak in the slide. 
Um, I wonder what um, that would be right. It very well could have been because he probably would have taken it on time lapse. Oh, yeah. So that might very well be a shooting star of some sort. Yeah, that's right. Okay, cool. And I don't think it's an aberration because he's he's a very good astronomer and um, a very good ast um, astron um, photographer of astronomy. Okay, moving on. Okay, so the next few slides actually show how astronomy is part of um, not only the, the science curriculum, but also um, the Tao as well, and I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. And so first of all, um, if you read that, that shows you how it can be taught. And there's a reason why I put the nature of science as well as the planet Earth and beyond strand there, and also um, the, uh, the natural world and the philosophy and history of science in the Pateo um, curriculum, and I'll explain what that is in a minute. So I'll just let you quickly look at that. And if there's any questions, just please ask me. Now in the document that you've got online, in the Word document, that's expanded. So I've actually put what each of those say. So what the nature of science bits are, what the planet and earth beyond strand says for different levels of the curriculum, I think one and two, and then years one and two, years three and four, um, which is your primary and, and intermediate, and then years um, five and six, which is years nine and 10 and 11, level six is 11, but sometimes in some schools, some stuff is actually taught at level level um, year 10 so um, I've I've kept that in there okay so any questions no, I'll need to get started. sorry oh. okay I'll go on right and then this is going through the New Zealand um, curriculum uh, and that just shows what is actually in the astronomy the actual um, science curriculum. These are achievement of objectives in um, the part called um, astronomical systems and that is expanded much more in that um, Word document you've got. So if you're a little bit confused then get that up in your Dropbox um, folder and you'll, you'll see what I'm talking about. It's in pretty colour so it's funny. You can, it should be easy to find. Uh, okay so that's what that is for the New Zealand curriculum, primary and intermediate, and that's what it is for years nine and ten. Any questions about that? Okay, so I'll move on. Uh, and here's um, Batoro. Um, years one to eight, just uh, you can read that. And I really like the fact that they've actually put in, I actually like this curriculum, and they've put in the space exploration there. And I'll say a bit more about that in a wee while. Okay, and then the next bit. Now the last bit there and the spatial relationships that impact on Earth, I think that is actually going back to the equivalent um, level in the in the New Zealand curriculum, which is about uh, learning about the cycles and how they affect planet Earth. Once um, when we used to teach astronomy, we would often teach about day and night and seasons and phases of the moon, quite separate from what actually their effect was on. Um, on planet Earth. So for example, the seasons, we didn't, and sun angles, and the, the angle the, the sun was hitting the Earth at different times of the day, we never went into that. And this this curriculum has ensured that there's far more of that more intimate relationship between what's happening out there and what is actually happening on Earth. And I think that that's what that last half sentence um, is stating in that um, level five and six. Tamata five and six. Any questions or comments or 
Oh, dog's got something to say. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, Jenny, that's our dog. No, don't <laughs> worry, it was quite cool. <laughs> okay, so just going on. Now, um, so to teach astronomy, and, and the, the reason for showing you all those other curriculum links, apart from the fact that the nature of science we need to be teaching anyway, um, the different aspects of nature of science, you know, how knowledge is built up, the different investigations that we do, the um, connection with socio-scientific issues and the kind of the literacy of science, literacy and, and symbols of science. Um, it also means that you don't have to rigidly stick to the science curriculum and either the New Zealand curriculum or the equivalent um, Maori curriculum, Pereo curriculum. You can, you, if you need to be justifying to someone your curriculum links, there's no reason why you can't use the nature of science or the philosophy of science um, in the Tereo um, curriculum. And so it really gives you, because the most important thing really is at this stage that you're just sparking children's interest. And if you need to, as I say, if you need to do your paperwork and justify it, then it, it is very easily justified in a number of ways. Um, and if you ever need a hand, you can just get me on an email and I can help you with that. But the, the very last bullet point is quite important. Um, it, it's, there's a lot of wow ideas out there, like the Big Bang, um, but kind of, you know, there's the Big Bang and sort of really in a way that's it. After that, there's not much you can teach or get kids, students to learn about the Big Bang that doesn't very quickly take them to something that's way um, too complex for them. And we find that a little bit sometimes that people are so keen to teach certain concepts that sometimes reasonably difficult ones are, are, are taught or introduced and then students when they get to high when secondary school when they can possibly do those in more detail there's a little bit of kind of oh we've we've done that and there's just so much as you can see from that document and all the all the ideas I've put after all the curriculum stuff uh, there's just so much you can do with students that I think you don't need to worry about um, you know, big bangs and stuff like that. I was a little bit disappointed when I saw um, some stuff that had been put together to teach astronomy to young students, and they were blowing up balloons with dots on, which is representing expansion of the universe and galaxies moving away from each other. And I must admit, my heart sort of sank a bit because I thought, okay, well, after that, what do you teach, Litleys? And, um, and so I think it's really good to just kind of stick with something that they can really connect. And I'll be going over some of those ideas in a minute. Okay, any comments or questions about that? Oh, I think it's very useful to hear that we can use the Maori um, curriculum. Oh, yes. I really, like, I, I really like that. Astronomy and all the earth sciences, which are my specialty, are all under the natural world with biology. And I really like that grouping, actually. I think it's great. Yeah. Okay. And, and apologies for any bad um, pronunciation on my part. Uh, so some ideas are, and these are all developed, and if there, if there is time, we will actually go over that. Uh, some of those, just some key ones I'll pick out to show you how very interdisciplinary stuff can be. But just to kind of go over the conditions on the different planets is 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 really cool. And you can particularly go on them and, and, and with little kids, and I've had a whole kind of haul full of little kids sometimes with, with talking about the conditions on different planets and saying, you know, do we want to go and live there? And all the little kids kind of scream back whether they want to live there or not live there. And and so you can do conditions in terms of, you know, start with Earth, look at how beautiful our Earth is, the green and the blue and the white and that, and then have a look at these other planets that are rocky and barren, <laughs> no water. And, and um, But at the same time, you're getting the concept of, of these kind of different planets. And, and there's so many fun things you can do. So you can't walk on Jupiter, for example, because it's too gaseous. Um, Saturn, you're supposed to be able to, if you had a body of water big enough, you could float on it. Um, there's lots of kind of lovely little catchy little stories that you can actually 
um, tell about the different planets. And I do have a, um, a PowerPoint on this, which I'll spend a little bit of time on. And at, at the moment, it's written particularly for a senior audience, but I'll, I'm halfway through doing a junior one, which goes through different planets and through key moons with, with good, good stuff about the different features. And just weird things like Venus spins backwards and, and its year is longer than its day. Its day is longer than its year. And, you know, lots of sort of catchy little things that you can capture um, students' imagination on. Also, a lot of the surfaces of a lot of these planets can actually be related to things that they know on Earth. So volcanoes, for example, on Mars, tectonic gash, which is on Mars, really thick, thick clouds on Venus can relate to a, a thick cloud day on planet Earth. And, and things that are just barren and rocky, and like in Mercury and on our moon, the same thing. So, um, so there's a lot of things that the students can kind of relate to um, in, in their own um, general knowledge about their own planet when you're actually going through these different planets. Okay, is there any um, questions on that? Okay, just moving on. Uh, oh, and I put what an hour is because um, I did go to my grandson's school and I had a PowerPoint on planets and yeah, it kind of went okay. And um, but then the next time I was doing one in Nelson, my hometown, and I went into my old school and grabbed their orrery and took the orrery. And orrery is, as you can see here, this is an example of one. It's got all the planets. Up at, um, and, and if you set this up, so they all move at the speed they actually are relative to each other. So, of course, Mercury starts whizzing around the sun immediately. And Pluto is, because this one still had Pluto on, was kind of crawling along at, at, in a very slow rate at the end. And the children were just fascinated. And so I'm, I think I'm personally sort of going to try and get one. And so this... This is what it looks like, sun in the middle, and uh, there's lots of different examples and beautiful, beautiful ones, but it's it's just worth somehow seeing if you can um, borrow one to show a, um, a class, because they, it, they, they get that kind of real hands-on aspect. They were, I just found these kids were just so fascinated at watching these planets go around. So I'll put that in there. Uh, any questions? Okay, now the moons. The moons are just fabulous. There's so many moons in the solar system. Mercury hasn't got any, but boring. Venus hasn't got any. Um, the Earth has got one or five, depending on who you ask, or depending on whether you're listening to Q, watching QI or not. Uh, we've got our main moon, which is um, this, the one on the top left, but we've also apparently got four little asteroids that um, go around us, but in huge great orbits. So you could almost argue that we've got five moons, but we've really actually um, got one, which is nice and round. Going along the top, the next one that looks like the Death Star is called Mimas. And of course, anyone who knows anything about Star Wars really likes the idea of a Death Star um, um, moon. The next one is um, to the right with the green background is Europa, which is one of the ones where there may be life. What you're actually seeing is a complete icy surface around the moon. And the cracks are because of the, the gravity of Jupiter kind of makes the, the ice flex and these cracks and sort of liquid comes up from what is seems very almost certainly there is a, a huge, quite deep liquid ocean there, deeper than our planet's ocean. And at the bottom of that, there's probably a whole lot of volcanoes and hydrothermal vents, very similar to what we actually get on planet Earth and we see on land in the Rotorua and Taupo area. So that's Europa, and then going to the bottom left is Hyperion, and that's actually not quite round, and so therefore um, it's not quite big enough to be round, and it tumbles chaotically around Saturn. The next one I always nickname the, the Pizza Moon, which is Io, which is around Jupiter, and that's just volcanoes everywhere. And the, but, but not from magma deep in the ground like Earth volcanoes, it's from this kind of um, tidal flexing from Jupiter. The next one is Miranda, which looks like a giant has actually attacked it with huge fingernails, but like scratching on a blackboard. 
and those cliffs are something like about 14 or 15 kilometers high and just right down the bottom you can see that it's lit so you can actually see one of those cliffs higher than a 14 yeah, kilometers high so higher than anything on earth and the next one's titan and titan's really interesting because titan is has also got um liquid and and a solid and gas but instead of being in water like earth it's in methane so i had a lot of fun talking to kids about how stinky it would actually be to go and visit titan but it also leads to if you're interested in that a lot of very interesting biology because you're potentially not using water as your universal solvent you're using methane and of course not nearly as much stuff dissolves in methane as it does in water so there's potentially some amazing biology so i mean there's there's all sorts of moons doing all sorts of crazy things so you can get these wonderful sort of images and, and talk to kids okay so is there any questions points about that okay so i'll move on uh could there be life on other planets or moons well there may be things called extremophiles and these tend to be actually tend to be microbial tend to be uh bacterial size or even smaller than that and they they live in in extremes so intense heat intense cold intense pressure intense um salinity salt intense acidity until um intense alkalinity extreme dryness extreme deepness um all that sort of thing and we've got all these on planet earth and so there's a there's a huge amount of research going on in astrobiology these days and, and people often come to New Zealand to learn about astrobiology because there's all the um, the, um, the hot pools and, and that sort of thing in the Taupo and Rotorua area and scientists come to collect um, samples and this sort of thing so in actual fact is, a, is quite a good um, cross-curricular idea that I've put uh, um, in the in the expanded word document is well, where's the intellectual property in this? I mean, if people are coming in and taking samples, and then if potentially they're making money out of them, then there's a whole um, discussion there to be had on intellectual property and and who owns that and who manages that. So, just to show you how that astronomy can go over into other topics as well. Okay, anything anyone wants to ask about that? There's a question in the chat. Oh, okay. I, I have to go out of the screen to find the chat. Oh, which I'm not finding. If you just go to the bottom of the screen, you should have, it should say chat along the bottom there somewhere. Can you read and, it to me? I'm not actually getting it easily, I must admit. Um, uh, my question was, um, why are all the planets on the same plane? Because that's the, that's the way they formed. Um, from when when stars are born, when matter is accreting to form a star, it also starts to spin, and and the heavier material actually spins out into what is known as a protoplanetary disk, and uh, and that and from that protoplanetary disk is flat or relatively flat. It's got a bit of kind of depth to it, but it's actually all in one plane. And um, and then the um, matter accretes accreted to actually um, form the planets from that, and they are all in the same plan, and they all go plane, and they all go around the sun in the same direction too. They also, except for Venus, all rotate in the same direction, and so it's quite possible that um, Venus got knocked by something early on in its life. Uranus is another funny one where it actually rotates kind of on its side. And so it may also have had some sort of great cosmic collision happening at some time. And one of the reasons why, why Pluto got um, demoted to a dwarf planet rather than a planet was because that it had what's known as an elliptical orbit and it wasn't on the same plane, um, the ecliptic, which is called the ecliptic plane, and it wasn't on the same plane. And so any, um, um, because another aspect, of course, is beyond Neptune. There is a whole lot of these, these, you know, 
even probably possibly even a hundred thousand kind of icy rocky bodies called the Kuiper Belt objects, and then even further on there's the Oort clouds, and that's where the comets all come from. And um, so there's a whole lot of stuff I simply haven't had time to sort of kind of add to what I've already done. But this yeah, this is the short period comets come the, um, like Halley's and that come from the um, Kuiper belt and the long ones that just appear out of nowhere every now and again and never return, uh, they come from the Oort cloud. But there's, they've already found several bodies that are dwarf planets size in the Kuiper belt. And there's actually, a there's actually a theory at the moment that there's something out there that's even possibly the size of Earth. Um, and they're telling that from the distortion in the orbits of three other kind of Kuiper belt bodies that they're checking. So there potentially could be more planetary sized objects out there. But all those Kuiper belt objects have got elliptical orbits kind of that sort of go like that. I don't know if you can see me in a little bit, sort of like that, whereas all the other planets kind of go in the ecliptic on that one plane. Does that answer your question? Hopefully it did. Okay, I'll move on then. Uh, now, there's a whole question of whether we could live on other planets or moons, and would we want to? I mean, huge amount of kind of discussion on there, and a very interdisciplinary topic as well. And this is just a nice image that I found as ideas for Mars settlement. But I could also see that there was quite a lot of there that, and sometimes with, with good images, um, there there's quite a lot that can actually be talked about. So there's obviously um, something that's for radar or radio communications or something like that off to the left. And there's a, a tower there that looks like it's kind of, kind of be doing something with pipes. So it may be piping, I don't know, possibly even methane from underground. It looks like plants being grown and all that sort of thing. And so, I mean, there's, there's that kind of technological aspect as well just not only whether the planet would be suitable, but whether we can actually make it sort of vaguely um, livable for us. Let me shut that door. Um, livable for us uh, if, if for some reason we wanted to go to another planet and live there. In reality, the only planet we're probably going to be able to go and live on realistically is uh, Mars. Mercury is too close to the um, sun. Venus is too hot and has got acid clouds. And the first spacecraft that tried to go there got dissolved <laughs> by acid or reacted by acid. Uh, Mars is a possibility. Asteroids could possibly be mined, but possibly not be lived on. None of the gas giants you can actually walk on the surface of and they're too far away. There are some moons we could possibly go to, but they're an awful long way to get there. So Mars really is the one at the moment that people are concentrating on. Okay, any comments or questions on there? Or if any chat comments come up, they could be read out to me because it's a bit of a mission for me to get back to the chat, I think. Okay, and that's all expanded in the, in the Word document. Uh, seems to me it would be awfully bleak life living in a device like that for any length of time. Yeah, when I went and talked to my grand um, son's class, and this is like five and six year olds, and I, I started talking about the planets by getting them to look at Earth first. And I talked a lot about look at the blueness and what does that represent and look at the greenness and what does that represent. Because I also wanted them to start you know, to start the journey of them really treasuring their own planet. And um, and it was very interesting that when they came to drawings afterwards, the boys started to draw kind of rockets. And the girls, and generally, and this generally was along gender lines, the girls were actually drawing the, the home planet. They were they got out the green and the blue crayons and they were drawing Earth, which I thought was very interesting. Um, there's There are some wonderful images that you can get in the next couple of slides have got some. So this was a, a comet that some of you might have seen. It appeared in the summer of 2007-2008 and just absolutely dominated the sky for 
you know, a couple of months actually, and it was, it was quite brilliant. I don't know whether any of you actually saw that or can remember seeing that. Um, okay, any anything anyone wants to say or ask? Right, the next one actually shows these are all what's known as planetary nebula, which is what will happen to our when our star, our sun, um, starts to run out of hydrogen. It will start fusing helium, and it will eventually um, become one of these beautiful structures. The outer layers will kind of um, go out and become. Uh, these beautiful kind of structures that you can see. And these are coloured, but they're coloured according to certain um, certain wavelengths of light and that sort of thing. So they're not just randomly coloured. Uh, but if you look at the centre of all of them, there's actually a white dot, and that is the white dwarf. And our, our um, sun will just end up as, the, these beautiful layers will eventually drift off, and our sun will end up as the small kind of dot in the, in the um, a, a white dwarf. It won't be uh, fusing any elements anymore. It won't be creating energy, but it will have a lot of, like really a sort of a piece of wood that's been maybe buried in the left to kind of smolder away. And it will gradually kind of radiate its heat out until it becomes a black dwarf. But these images are quite amazing and particularly also as a stimulus for any artwork and stuff like that. They, I've known artists who will actually go on the Hubble site and just look at some of these images and get inspired by them. Okay, any other points? Any Anything anyone wants to say? Right, use humour and tell stories. And I used to find this um, um, when it ever, because I taught girls, and whenever I got to the slide, they'd go, oh. <laughs> and I went and, and did some stuff at a primary school, and they also had this, why did Pluto get kicked out? And somehow the story had been told that Pluto got kicked out. I did actually go and talk to the teachers and say, maybe we could just be a slight tad more sort of, you know, the reasons a little bit. But it's it's an interesting story. Why did um, Pluto get demoted from a planet to a, to a dwarf planet? And there has been another um, dwarf planet that was um, a planet for 50 years, and that is Ceres, which is a small, which is the only asteroid that's actually big enough. And the asteroid belt is between Mars and Jupiter, and it's the only um, asteroid that is big enough to be round. And when that was first discovered for about 50 years, that was a planet. And then they, I don't think it was dwarf planets then, they called it something else. I can't remember off the top of my head um, what it was. But, um, yeah, so and so there's there's interesting stories all about Pluto, and if any of you want want to know the reasons why, um, there's actually four um, requirements for a planet to be a planet, and one is that it has to have enough mass to be round. Another is it is orbiting the um, the sun. Another is that it has to um, not it has to have enough gravity to um, to either kind of almost vacuum up any kind of little bits and pieces as it goes around in its orbit, or to deflect those bits and pieces. And just temporarily, I've forgotten the fourth one, I'm sorry. I might think of it as I go on. But Jupiter has got lots of kind of little moons around it that are quite close to it. Um, and so it was, and, and apparently its orbit has got a lot of debris in it. And so it was deemed not to be a planet for those reasons. And I'll try and think of what the fourth one is in a minute, but I can't quite think of it. It is in this PowerPoint that I will do, and also um, stuff on the Kuiper Belt and comets too. So I'll get that hopefully up on the shared Dropbox, maybe before the end of the year anyway. Um, okay, anything there? Any points? Oh, uh, Jenny, Karen's just uh, put on the chat a question. Um, yep. are, are there places that you can go to that have a good number of these types of stories? Good question, Karen. Uh, yeah, I guess I've kind of accumulated a heck of a lot over the years. So when I do the planetary thing, I'll try and put as many of those things as I can. No, it's actually a very good point. Um, 
And the answer is at the moment, I'm not too sure. I do actually have a book on um, Maori astronomy that I'll show you in a wee while, and that's got stories um, in it. Um, but no, that's a very good point. That's something I've just kind of gathered over the years. But although a lot of the sites like NASA, the NASA sites, if you go to the um, and uh, universe to go, I think it is, and I'll find a list of those sites and I'll put those online as well. Um, they will often have stories in them. So if you particularly go to the children's section, they're usually written very well. They're written so they're giving the information, but they're not dumbing it down in a, in a way. They're doing it appropriate to the audience, but not in a sort of patronising way or anything like that, not a dumbing down way. So you, sh you should be able to get some of the stories that way. And I just accumulated them by reading lots of those sites um, over the years. Uh, you can also get Twitter, of course, of various sites that you're interested in. You can get tweets. Um, I also get yeah notifications from different sites that I'm interested in, and I just accumulate them like that. Okay. Right. Uh, now another thing, another thing to do is to observe solar eclipses when you can. Uh, this is showing actually solar eclipses. There's solar and there's lunar eclipses. A solar eclipse, of course, is when the moon passes over the sun. And I was lucky enough to watch one in 2012. I went to Cairns and watched it. Um, there's going to be one down uh, crossing central Otago and finishing at Dunedin, um, I think in 2028 in August. And so I'm certainly intending to go down there and go into central Otago and see if I can watch it and apparently Alexandra is going to be the best place to watch it where you'll see it for longest. Um, in Dunedin it finishes at the end of the day and in the middle of winter and I'm not holding my breath about whether you'd actually see it in winter or not. Uh, so there's different, there's, this is just showing you the uneclipsed sun, a partial eclipse which is relatively common and it is you have potential to see that, and of course that would happen during the day. An annular eclipse is when the uh, the sun is actually the moon is too far away from the Earth, so it's smaller relatively, and it won't completely cover the sun. But the absolute gold-plated um, thing to do is actually to see a, a total solar eclipse, and it's absolutely the most unbelievable thing when you can actually see one. There's a there's a technique called back reflecting. And um, if you can back reflect an image, because the, the one thing, of course, that you mustn't do is make sure that students ever look at the sun without some sort of filter or without some sort of special glasses. Um, when, if you actually are lucky enough to see a total solar eclipse, you can take your glasses off to, to actually see the total solar eclipse, otherwise you don't see it. But as soon as that total solar eclipse disappears, glasses have to go straight back on again. Any points about that or any chats, questions? Um, Jenny, I had a quick thing about Pluto. It's only the three, so you didn't miss any off. Oh, it's only the three. Oh, good. Yeah. So you're <laughs> oh, okay. I thought there was four. <laughs> <laughs> no, you got it. Nailed it. <laughs> good. Thank you. Uh, okay, the same techniques can be used for viewing sunspots. And sunspots, are, these are areas of lower temperature on the surface of the sun, and they go in an 11 year cycle. So at the moment, we just pass what's known as solar minimum. And so we're building up to solar maximum when you actually get a lot of, um, a lot of uh, sunspots. And sometimes they can be quite huge. They're areas of intense magnetism. The temperature of the surface of the sun is about 6,000 um, degrees Kelvin and you can effectively say Celsius if you're talking to, to young children uh, and but the sunspots are just a little bit cooler and they're because of intense magnetism that actually happens in the sun and what is really really interesting is that because of this intense magnetism that the sun's poles every 11 years actually swap around and that is something that I'd talk about with with um older kids because then it actually leads on to the Earth's magnetism which swaps around about every 300,000 years. But 
but with the sun, and it doesn't mean the earth turns upside down or anything, it just means that north and south poles um, change, they take about 3,000 years to actually change. And the north and south poles tend to wander around anyway, the, the magnetic north and south poles. But the sun, every 11 years it flips, so north becomes south and south becomes north, and then 11 years later it kind of flips back again. And it's something to do with the intense magnetism, and I don't know any more about it than that. Um, any, any points about that? Looks like fly spots. Um, but you do need um, you do need solar filters. You wouldn't see this with special solar glasses. You really need something that can magnify it. And if you ever are lucky enough to get a telescope with um, a solar filter, you have to be one thousand percent watching that telescope the whole time because um, just because it would be so dangerous if any sunlight got in and got into any student's eyes, it would be blindness basically. So you have to be incredibly careful, but it's it's worth it if you've got good sunspots to show the students. That also leads on to another really interesting thing to talk about. Oh, sorry, I'll just, okay, I'll get to that in a minute. Um, this is showing a lunar eclipse. This is obviously a sequence. They're not quite so rare and they go on for longer, but they tend to happen in the middle of the night. Uh, so really good for a viewing night, particularly if you've got somewhere where you can all kind of lie down and watch them and viewing nights are a great way to involve parents and I've run viewing nights for a lot of years for a lot of my all my years at the school that I was teaching at and they were always um, pretty popular and parents would often come and and younger siblings would come as well which was a lot of fun uh, so the lunar eclipse of course is when you have a blood moon um, I found my grandson got a bit scared by that term, a blood moon, um, but that's what it's actually called. And, it, and, it's, and it's red, and it doesn't go completely black because this is the, the Earth's shadow covering the moon and enough sunlight leaks round the side of the, um, of the Earth to actually shine a little bit on the moon so that you get... Uh, so that you actually get the um, the red appearance. Okay, anything anyone wants to ask? Right. Jenny, what's okay. a blue moon? A blue moon is when you get two full moons in a month. So you'll usually get one right at the very beginning of the month, and it's usually in a month that's 33 days, so you get it right at the end. Nothing to do with the colour? Nothing to do with the colour, okay. no. But the interesting thing is, the last time there was a blue moon, New Zealand didn't have a blue moon because of our, our place on kind of the international, you know, close to the international date line. We just didn't quite, we weren't quite two blue moons. But as far as we were concerned, we had two blue moons. It, it was, I forget the time, it, you know, ours was just before when it, it flipped over to the next month or something like that. Um, but yeah, that is, that, that's getting two, two full moons in my month. Yeah. Uh, okay, Aurora Australis are great to watch. You most, both, mostly have to go down to Dunedin to see it. My son rang up one night when he was down at Varsity and went basically, no, 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 to me, guess what I can see. And this was actually a photograph actually of this particular Aurora. So it was quite spectacular. Um, but you can quite often see it if you've got to spare three thousand dollars. You can a plane trip now goes once a year down to the um, the Antarctic Circle, which is also where you mostly see auroras, and you're pretty well guaranteed seeing auroras. Quite a lot of money. I think I could probably spend the same amount and go to Norway. So, uh, but uh, yeah, that's pretty spectacular. Uh, so this is the sun showing. Uh, Sunspots and solar flares, which is something you can talk about. And what is so the bottom left hand thing is a solar flare. Um, the ones sort of up more to the right are kind of solar prominences. That what looks white on that is actually sunspots. And of course, this is looked at with a special filter. And that um, sort of orange, lighter, darker orange is actually just the surface of the sun, it's not smooth or anything like that. 
there's this kind of like this boiling sort of plasma all the time, and that's what you're seeing there. But what is really interesting about if we get a really bad solar mass, um, coronal mass ejection or a solar flare, then it can actually can knock out our digital networks. And the um, and the the likelihood of this is actually fairly similar to having a really bad earthquake. And I tend to say the sun throws a hissy fit, but uh, about 22 years ago, so before all our um, electronics got very, you know, very small components, there was a major solar flare that actually hit um, North Canada and knocked out power for three days in the middle of winter. And it knocked out all the kind of um, conductor, the insulators um, and conductors. And, you know, if you go and look at a substation, you see these big chunky kind of um, ceramic kind of white things that are partly the resistors. That's the word I want, the resistors, as the, as the power is going through. And they got knocked out. And these days, all our, all our um, computers and phones and everything have resistors that are kind of millimeters in size. And so there is a, you know, if we got, now it's, it's very rare, but it's not impossible. If we got a coronal mass ejection of solar flare hitting our magnetic field that's around our planet at just the wrong angle, then it could um, cause this sort of damage. Back in the 19th century, there was something called the Carrington event, which was a major, um, obviously a major solar flare, and that caused um, electricity to sort of flow along all the telegraph lines and it was causing fires. And um, there, was, um, there was this incredible auroras and people were able to read kind of papers in the middle of the day and you know, all this phenomenal kind of stuff going on. And apparently not too long ago, we, were, we had just moved along in the Earth's orbit by about a week of a major coronal mass ejection. That if we'd been kind of a week back in our orbit, um, seven days back in our orbit, we would have been hit with this massive coronal mass ejection. Captain Cook apparently um, in the equator once saw an aurora. And so that means some massive geomagnetic thing was going on. Uh, the, the paradoxical thing about this, which is a, which I've also expanded in your Word document, is that the first world countries will suffer more than the third world countries because we are more dependent on um, on computers than they are. And so I've put in there that a wonderful link to this could be, okay, what skills might we need to go back to, um, or are worth keeping alive just in case we were ever in the situation where we couldn't use our computers and one example of this was um, how we all got worried about the millennium bug uh, back in, in the year 2000 1999 going over to 2000 and one of my friends whose husband was responsible for making sure all the water stayed on and the sewage stayed you know the sewage pump station stayed on spent the new year of millennium sitting up in the office um, hoping that the millennium bug didn't hit the computers that made sure all the, the sewage got removed properly and the water still was being pumped and all that sort of thing. So that was kind of gives you an idea of, of um, you know, the extent to how we have to be um, mindful or the powers that be that run our infrastructure have to be mindful of this sort of thing. So it's the sort of thing that you could discuss with an older age group, and certainly year nine and year tens, um, I imagine, would be quite interested about this and horrified at the thought of their wouldn't be able to use their phone for, for a, um, you know, what could be quite a long time. It would also affect all the GPS as well, something like this, an event like this. And so planes couldn't fly and all that sort of thing. GPS couldn't yes. work. Um, and, and it would, oh, uh, what I should have said, it, would, it wouldn't be the whole planet that would be affected, but it would be large areas, so maybe the whole of the North Island or something like that, or the eastern seaboard of um, Australia, you know, Queensland or something like that. Any comments or questions? Or There's a, there's a question on the um, chat. What's the difference between the Aurora Australis and the Aurora Borealis aside from hemisphere? Is there one? No, 
No, just hemisphere. Okay, cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, I'll move on, having given everyone a scare. Uh, there's wonderful historical and artistic connections, and uh, I was lucky enough to see, there was really bad weather over most of Nelson, but I was very lucky to see for about 40 minutes the transit of Venus in June 2012. Uh, we managed to um, get an instrument where we set it up and a lot of the, our school managed to see it for a while, but unfortunately the weather um, all came in and it was only visible for about 40 minutes. But the transit of Venus relates to, relates to, um, relates to Captain Cook because one of the reasons he came you know, his voyages that he did into the Pacific were to observe the transit of Venus. And at that stage, if you got a transit of Venus reading, because the transit of Venus is weird, it happens something like once every 114 years and then every eight years and then every 114 and then every eight years. And it goes on like that. So it's the, you see it from the Northern Hemisphere after the 114 years, and I think I've got that number of years right, and then after the eight years, you said in the southern hemisphere, and if that by comparing those two readings and maybe even triangulation a bit, you, it, it was the only way of getting an accurate um, distance from the Earth to the Sun, and you needed that to be it to help you determine longitude because latitude for sailors um, whether they they were, um, you know, Pacific people, um, early Maori come to New Zealand, or whether they were Europeans sailing. Latitude was very, pretty easy because of the, the height of the sun. Uh, and if you're in the northern hemisphere, it was Polaris, the pole star, and the southern hemisphere, it was the position of the southern cross relative to other key stars like Achenar. And uh, but longitude was always very difficult to tell, and this this actually helped the transit of Venus. Um, always actually helped that. Uh, there's Halley's comet appears in art, and and you can actually trace it in art. And and uh, I had a Halley's comet story to tell at my um, son's um, wedding because. He woke up as a baby to feed at a certain time, and I managed to see Haley's comet when it last came through going towards the sun, and it still had a tail. So I went back and found that the, the records are actually 2000 BC of Haley's comet was being recorded. Um, so there was lots of kind of, if you go online, there's lots of artwork showing Haley's comet. And then, of course, the first telescope was Galileo, and that is, and I'm sorry, I don't know the name of the king, but there's Galileo showing the Spanish king at that time, or the Italian king, sorry, um, of um, the first telescope. There's, so there's some amazing historical and artistic connections. And, and also really, really interesting ones to do with um, Pacific navigation as well, where they use certain stars. Um, and so, for example, if Sirius, the dog star, the brightest star in the sky, was up above at a certain time of the year, then they should be at a certain bit of land. If um, if um, the constellation of Orion was up, up, you know, directly up above them at certain times of year, they were over another bit of um, land. And that combined with wave patterns, which they could read very accurately, um, a reflection of the green from an atoll on a cloud, all sorts of other ways they were able to navigate around the Pacific in ways that we would only kind of dream of. Um, so really interesting um, historical, cultural, um, art connections and cross-curricular stuff there. Uh, any more questions about that? Uh, okay, so... Obviously, Matariki is uh, an important thing. It's very interesting that Matariki is part of a lunar cycle. And so, it, although I think it would be wonderful to replace the Queen's birthday weekend with a Matariki weekend, you can't just nail it down to a weekend because it's following the lunar cycle in a similar way that Easter actually is following a lunar cycle because Easter is always the first Sunday after 
um, first full moon after the um, the uh, equinox, and so that's how Easter is determined, which is why it moves all the time. And Matariki also moves. One thing that I found out this year, and thanks to um, Karatina from the Carter Observatory for this, was that um, apparently Matariki is particularly Matariki, although it's a constellation that, that Europeans know as Pleiades and every culture in the, in the world just about has got a different name for this um, constellation, um, it is only Matariki when it's actually um, just poking above the horizon and kind of in that June-July time. Um, the rest of the time when we're still calling Pleiades, Pleiades, Matariki then becomes a, a part of a different constellation like the Great Walker uh, in the sky. And then when Matariki sets in April, when you don't actually see it any longer, it's got another name again. Now, I do need to get that PowerPoint off Caratina, and I'll do that, and I'll um, put it onto the website as well, because this was something quite new that Haratina had been exploring and um, and yeah quite quite fascinating so I used to point up into the sky and say look these are Pleiades which is also Matariki but apparently it's not strictly Matariki then yeah I, and I hope that's accurate <laughs> I'll make sure I'll make sure that gets verified before I actually um, put it up online um, any questions or points people want to make? Oh, how am I going for time? Should I speed up? It's uh, fascinating. I don't know how long you want to carry on for. You've, you've, you've had a, almost an hour, and um, I'm really enjoying it. I don't know about other people. Well, I was assuming we'd be an hour and a half at the most, and I'll be finished in an hour and a half, but I won't. Um, I'll, I'll just speed up a bit and see how we go as to whether we get onto the document or not. So. Because right. the document kind of just expands all of this. Cool. Um, okay, I'll keep moving on. Okay, I, identifying constellations. So I've just put the prominent ones that are particularly in the summer sky here. So there's Pleiades down on the left. And then you can see Taurus, um, Orion, which is often called the pot. Um, New Zealand is called the pot because that central part is actually um, looks like a pot. And then, of course, Canis Major, and there's the dog star Sirius, and this is meaning the big dog. Uh, so those are the main constellations that are in the sky in the summer. And if you're interested in different stars and you're giving a viewing night, Sirius, of course, is the brightest star in the sky, and that's a white star. Betelgeuse is orange, um, um, red-orange. Uh, and Rigel up here is blue. And if you've got a telescope or even... And you can show them through the telescope. It doesn't, of course, make them any bigger, but it intensifies the colour. And the colour relates to temperature. And so blue is actually the hottest. White will be second. And um, Betelgeuse is actually, uh, is, is means that it's cooling. It's also a star that could potentially at some stage go supernova, along with the red star that's in the, in the Scorpio um, um, constellation in the winter. Um, there's a red star there, which also, Echina, which also could go supernova. Here's a, another star called Aldebaran, which is actually a yellow-orange, and that's a, a really good, um, another one if you want to look at different coloured stars. And then I've got, this is what a monthly chart, you can get star charts. This is one that has obviously been put together from the University of Canterbury, but um, the Royal Astronomical Society, you can go onto their website every month and actually have a look at um, what constellations are visible in the sky. And you can also see what planets are visible in the sky. So they're showing Jupiter on the bottom right-hand corner there. So Jupiter is pretty well out. But Mars, which is at sort of one o'clock um, near the middle, um, that's still quite visible in the sky as, as quite orange. And of course, this winter, the, there were four planets in the sky just looking absolutely stunning. Um, okay, and then I've got this book, which uh, I know you can get this from the Carter Observatory. I have not had the time to go into it as much as possible. Um, can you actually see the little, no, you probably actually can't see much. 
If there's time at the end, I'll show you a few pages of it, but there's a lot of kind of different stories on different constellations in the sky, and a lot of um, um, stories um, relating to uh, cultural um, Pareo Maori um, aspects, and a lot of kind of really interesting things. Some of them are familiar stories, like um, the separation of the earth and the, and the sky, um, Papa Tuanuku and um, Tangara and uh, Ranganui, Ranganui, and uh, and then some of them that aren't quite so familiar. So that is a, a little book that's actually well worth getting. I've also put it, it's actually in the very last row of that document. I've actually put the publisher as well if you want to um, try and get one through the publisher. But I think it would be well worth having. Uh, okay, now there's a, a lot of interesting stuff you can do about um, history. To, um, next year is the 50th anniversary of the Apollo 11 and the first moon landings, and I know certainly our museum in, in Nelson is going to have something on, and I suspect that a lot of museums around the place will have something on and be worth going into. Whether you go into the controversy of whether we landed on the moon or not, I found a few you know, like 10, 15 years ago, people would get bothered about that, but now people don't seem to be bothered about it at all. Um, I think people just assume it went because we're talking about going to Mars. So, and a lot of good stuff on YouTube about this. Um, I think that's actually Buzz Aldrin, the person on the left hand, but the uh, Apollo 11, but the other photo I think is from another mission when they had a pretty good moon buggy that they traveled around the surface on. Also, you could, if you're talking about gravity and that sort of thing with students, you can go on and just watch some of the pictures where it shows the, the uh, astronauts kind of sort of bounding over the surface and to just to show that the gravity was um, is a sixth of the Earth so, and it's seen by the way that they work and um, walk. And I put other ideas about how you can mimic greater gravity and um, if you've got older students and want to try and, it's more kind of probably seniors, but if you want to tell them the difference between mass and um, mass and weight, I used to say, you know, I'm a certain size. If I go to the moon, am I still the same size? And of course, everyone says, yes, of course, you're the same size, which is my mass. But of course, weight is a function of gravity. And so you actually... Um, you you will actually bound along the surface of the moon because gravity is not pulling along um, down on you so much. Okay, um, any any questions about that? If that's expanded in that um, word document. Okay, moving on. Oh, we're actually right near the end of this. This is actually right at the end. I didn't realise. Uh, just back to this a little bit, seeing we're further on than I thought. Uh, uh, there's also another thing that you can do for gravity where maybe if you've got one old coat or something with lots of pockets, you could actually put a whole lot of kind of rocks um, in it and just um, get students, you could even do this with lit leaves, maybe getting them to jump and then to actually put on this coat with all sorts of rocks in the pockets which kind of weighs them down a bit and seeing how well they can jump then and they might get a sense of what the different kind of gravities um might be like. So that's kind of a simple thing that you can do. And there's a few ideas of that in the um, document. Now there's also kind of various issues and of course one of the big issues is, is light pollution and the other issue that's only just really hit um, the paper, the newspaper of course, is the blue light emitted by LED lights and apparently that's supposed to be terribly bad for you in the evening. It's really good during the day because that's what keeps you awake. But during the evening, it's it's not so bad. And if you look at, I've always had a lot of international students, students from different countries in my classes, and they'd be quite amazed at different features of this. And so um, if when you, I, don't, I can't actually, oh yeah, if I expand the screen, you ha can, you can really see the, um, the United States-Canadian border, which is quite fairly obvious. 
Um, you can also, if you actually have a look in Russia, you can see the roads, the edges of the roads. You can see major cities. There's London, there's Paris, Berlin's going to be along in here somewhere, Rome, Naples, um, Madrid, um, Lisbon. You can see uh, this one always used to catch them out. I had a picture of this. This is all the, um, the stuff along the Nile. And then you get to kind of Africa where there's kind of hardly anything except maybe down for Johannesburg and Cape Town. India was really interesting. And India wasn't so much kind of bright neon lights and that, but just so many people and so many kind of little hamlets all with their own generators and that sort of thing. China, also Japan, amazing um, amount of light in Japan. Australia, particularly along the eastern seaboard in Perth and New Zealand, um, some as well with there with you can see Auckland, New Plymouth, Wellington, Christchurch, but a lot of the South Island quite dark. And I always feel that uh, these two, are, you know, to me the issue of light pollution Oh, I'm sorry, I don't know what's quite happened to my slide. There we are. Um, the issue of light pollution is actually, it's a winnable issue in a way. It, I don't see why towns can't change their lights and only have down lights and have them yellow. And it's a heck of a lot cheaper than some of the other issues of our planet at the moment, like plastic pollution and climate change and loss of diversity. And I get quite concerned sometimes at, at just how students are feeling with these kind of really big problems and worry about being overwhelmed and even mental issues. And it seems to me that this is something that potentially students could, particularly older ones, could get stuck into and petition the councils and things like that. And it's potentially winnable and also... Um, creating dark sky places. So in Nelson at the moment, we're trying to create two dark sky places. So places out in the country that are deliberately kept dark so that people can go out to those parks and have a look at the stars. And I think those are, are things that students could take on and get some satisfaction, hopefully, from getting somewhere so that it's not all these kind of massive problems that are sort of rather overwhelming at the moment. So. Right, and that's my PowerPoint, and hopefully I've ended up on a reasonably upbeat note. Uh, are there any questions? Anything anyone wants to say, discuss? If you want to say something, unmute your microphone. Um, kia ora, Jenny, it's Janine here. Hi. Um, I just want to say thank you, first of all, that was awesome. Um, but also, uh, I think it's a really good point what you say about doing observing nights as a way to get the whole community involved. Um, yeah. I experience the same thing because everyone is interested at in looking through a telescope and even if they're not, they are once they've done it. Um, right. And if, uh, if anyone at a school does want, doesn't have a telescope and doesn't have access to one, then... Um, you and I both have that list of astronomical societies across the right. country yeah. and all kind of space or astronomy organizations that basically it tells you whether that place can provide a telescope for you or provide someone who can um, run a telescope for you and or someone that can talk to you about astronomy in general. Um, so I just thought I could probably put that in the Dropbox. Um, yeah. That would be great. And also a lot of these astronomers with the flash, with good telescopes, they're often retired too, and they're yes. able to possibly come to a school or do it, or if they're not retired, they're mad keen. And <laughs> they would do an evening um, observation. The only thing you do have to find sometimes is to make sure they're teaching at the level. So you might need to give them a bit of advice about the level to actually talk yes. to your students because yeah. that can be the only thing sometimes that just, it sort of spills out of them and language that, you know, and you look, I watch my students go absolutely blank on <laughs> Yeah, no, I completely agree with that. Yeah, so I think yeah. it's, it's good to give them a bit of a heads up at what, what kids the level are at, because they're not going to know, yeah. Yeah, and I've, yes, I, I've done such a sort of a cook's tour, really, of everything, all the different things, in the hope that there'll be things that, stimulate your imagination. Now, 
Um, should, should we just have a quick look at this document? I'm, I, I'm planning to stop at nine. I hope, does that suit everyone? I think we'll all turn into pumpkins about nine, won't we? Sounds good. Yeah, um, so I'll just see if I can, so if I shut this down, um, save, yes, I did actually make a change. If I shut this down and and I want to share something again, so I'll just share this this other document. I oh, hear it is webinar presentation. So I think I'm sharing that now. Can you see that? Yep. Okay. So uh, up the top is all the curriculum stuff, relevant strands, uh, the achievement aim. So nature of the other nature nature of science. Achievement aims, not the achievement objectives. They're, they're teased out as achievement objectives for each um, e each level of the of the curriculum. But that was going to make too big a document. Um, so I've at least got the achievement aims, and then I've got the planet, the equivalent planet and Earth beyond. And I actually have got level seven and level eight in this because I'll probably use this particular bit for other reasons as well. So I've just got that in there for completeness. And the same with the Tamarautanga of Aotearoa. Um, the same thing, you've got the aims um, there, the aims and the philosophy and history of science, which is their overview. And then also the Ranganui um, Taumata or different levels there. So that's there and I don't see any reason why you can't you know, use whatever you want in there, and particularly if you're particularly interested in something and the students are really dead keen or something happens like a massive comet appears in the sky, I'm sure you can justify it under one of these um, curriculum statements, objectives. And then I've just kind of, I've just teased this out as much as possible. So I've done topics and possible activities. I was going to do year level and then I found that so many of these could be made smaller or simpler for young children and a bit more complex for older children um, that that I didn't end up doing the year level uh, but I've got lots of ideas and I've tried to um, put um, Tereo's sort of connections in there as I've gone along as much as I could uh, I've also tried to, to put a lot of hands-on activities because one of the things with astronomy is that you can end up with nothing for the students to kind of just simply feel and touch or go outside and do or whatever. And so I've tried to do that as much as possible. So it's not just um, images or TV, YouTube clips or, or um, computers. Uh, so I could just take just two or three things. Um, yeah, look, so for example, in this first one, distance from the sun, find out which planets can be seen by the naked eye and which could be seen by Mara before they had access to telescopes. Is there any difference in the number? And if so, why? And sometimes I've actually put the answer there to help you, which is probably light pollution. But that I think there is a difference actually by about one planet as to what um, people could see when the skies were completely dark and what they're actually easily able to see now. And so Mercury's not usually very able to see and Saturn sometimes can be quite dim. Um, there are some people that think that um, Maori used to be able to see um, Uranus, but I'm not, I'm not too sure about that. Uh, there's a few activities in the relative mass and grav gravity there. So I've tried to put activities rather than content. There's not a lot of content in this. In that PowerPoint that I'll, I'll, I'll um, get finished, there, there'll be contact content in that. Uh, but this has got activities, and that's where I've got about the coat with pockets full of heavy objects and that sort of thing. Day lengths and year lengths, there's a, you can do a postcard from a planet. And I always did, because I was teaching girls, I used to do, um, you know, because one rotation is the day and one orbit is a year. And so I, I used to say, well, find out how long each day you have to wait for lunch and how long um, would you have to wait for your birthday. So obviously in Mercury, you're only waiting about 88 days for your birthday. Whereas um, if you're out in, um, in Neptune, you're waiting 200, you know, a huge 
um, a huge number of days. You're waiting sort of several several years for your birthday. And the same with lunch. Try and get them a sense of these planets have got different days and different um, different day lengths and different year lengths. And also then to write a postcard saying what their planet actually looks like to, to people back home. And um, and they would say whether it was rocky and of course if it's Mars, whether it's orange and whether they're having trouble getting around like on Jupiter and that sort of thing. So that fits in nicely with special characteristics and then often particularly with older students who have maybe done a bit of reading or watch maybe some sci-fi stuff or even Doctor Who if it comes to that. Um, you can have, with older students, you can have great conversations about different planets. And they just seem to know a whole heap of stuff, whether they've read it with, with parents at home or whether another teacher has talked about it with them. You can have these incredibly long conversations with them that are just great. With little kids, I love to do it from the would we want to go and live there sort of idea, talk about the characteristics. And, and that's a good way of involving them. How many moons is really interesting because, you know, Jupiter Jupiter's now up to about 80-something moons, 86 or something, and Saturn's up to 83. And every time another space probe goes past, they find more moons. And some of them are quite weird. So sort of moons are pretty cool as well. And uh, Mars is really the only planet where you'd expect there to be life. Uh, and and that even that's going to be underground. Europa and Celebus and Titan are the are the moons where, in actual fact, if we could get there, there it would be very surprising if there wasn't life because you've got in with Enceladus and Europa you've got ice, then then an ocean, then you've got volcanic activity which provides heats and lots of minerals, and you could very well get um, extremophiles. Um, in the form of bugs living there. So there's a bit of a difference between what life would we find on a, on a planet or a moon and would we go there as humans ourselves. So there's kind of two different things there in a way and probably best treated separately too. And, and I would imagine that life on planets and extremophiles would be something to do with, with older children but I think with younger children, you could introduce the idea, well, well would, would we go and live there? And what would we have to do? Would there be oxygen? Would there be water? Where would we get our water? Where would we get our oxygen? Could we grow our food? I mean, you know, all those sorts of sort of fundamental questions. And it's also useful to just, you know, to just show how great our own planet is at the same time. So, uh, yeah, so hot, heaps and heaps and heaps of ideas in there. Uh, I think probably I don't have time to go through everything. But now one thing, of course, also I haven't had time to either do or even find is worksheets for these. It would be good. Um, Janine, this Dropbox will just, these teachers will be able to access it forever, will they? Uh, they will. Yeah. Yeah. So, so if people find good worksheets, and if I find good worksheets, we could put it into the Dropbox. Yeah, sure. They've all got editing ability, so they yeah. can do what they want with it. There's good stuff on um, online. Um, in fact, there's lots of different places in NASA, and as I said, I'll find these websites. There are lots of good places where you can go and get good worksheets that can be used. Or that, or that can be adaptable, or that will give you ideas. And so if people find good stuff and they put them online, we can eventually build up sort of an, um, a, a database of them. Uh, okay, there's a lot on space exploration. Now, that's not exactly in the curriculum, but I'm sure it can be justified under nature of science or under philosophy of science or under the um, other, other means. And it's in the... Um, Terea curriculum anyway. And uh, what I was saying, so there's a whole interesting thing to do with at the moment, if we're going to explore other planets and moons, we send space probes, and they can do a lot. There's now a lot of instrumentation that can be carried. It all kind of sends signals back to Earth. 
You can have probes that can take samples of rocks or sample of water if they get to somewhere where there's some kind of liquid. Um, you could maybe give one um, a space probe a drill that could possibly drill through the ice of Europa or Enceladus and see if they can get some water and see if there's any life in there. Uh, there's all sorts of things that can be done with space probes. Uh, humans going overseas is a different thing again. And again, online, there's, there's some good stuff about astronauts living on the International Space Station. There's very good stuff on, on the problems that uh, humans would face if they're in zero gravity for any length of time. And one of the main ones is the blood distribution all around your body gets quite differently. Also, we need gravity to put calcium into our bones. If you lose gravity, you, your bones start to get very, very weak. And if any of you have ever seen YouTube clips of astronauts returning from the long journeys on the international, long times on the International Space Station, they always get taken out of their Soyuz capsule and put into a chair. They're not allowed to walk because their bones are actually too weak and they have to go back and do special exercises to get the calcium back into their bones and to get their, any muscle wastage to be built up again too so they don't actually you know go straight home to their families they have to go into a special facility where they have to build up their muscles make sure they haven't brought any bugs back from where they are you know they have to be quarantined effectively so all sorts of really interesting stuff that you can talk about there and the space suits you know what do they need for a space suit so they can go outside the spacecraft and then if they're actually going to mars how long does it go to Mars, how long does it take to go to Mars? And I used to have an office which was about the right size for a spacecraft and I'd go and tell everyone to actually go into, wash into that office and say, okay, now you've got to live there for nine months while you go to Mars. And then, and then I'd say, oops, there's some radiation coming from the sun so you have to go into the radiation shielded part so you'd make them all go and hide under your desk, which of course was incredibly small for the three days while the radiation goes past so you can you can sort of do some quite interesting sort of simulations with kids about well what would it really be like to be in a spacecraft going to mars another one is how long communications take so light takes eight minutes to get from the sun to us and the further you get away from earth the longer um, your radio communications are going to be so we would always mimic sending a text or talking to your mum on the on a, on a phone satellite phone or something and 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 pretending how long they would actually have to wait. Um, okay, it looks like I've got some questions, have I? Because I saw something flashing just then. Is that right? Have I got some questions? The last question I saw is um, just a comment that Matariki is an awesome way to bring the community into the school. I can't see any oh, more questions. Absolutely wonderful. Just, just fantastic. We have the um, victory. We have a whole community centre that puts on this whole big thing to the point where the Astronomical Association, when they have their viewing of, of Matariki, they make sure they don't clash with this big community event. Yeah. But I saw something. Oh, it's got more eight, chat eight. Shall I just check? I've done all the questions. Oh, there's the Matariki one. Oh, thank you. I like, oh, there's a good solar system scale example. That the, and there's a website for that, which is great. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, I think those are the ones. Are there any more that I haven't seen? Planets on the same level. Places you can go to have a good number of types of stories. I'll address that one. Um, that looks like all of them, I think. It looks like all of them, yeah. So right at the very, so the whole kind of human aspect is quite a different thing. And if you want to fit in with economics, I mean, it's a heck of a lot cheaper to send space probes than it is to send humans out in space by a factor of zeros. You know, if it was a thousand bucks to send a space probe, it would be a million bucks to send a human sort of thing. And um, so there's another kind of interesting thing to discuss too, is why do humans want to go to space? What's the point of going there? Would we really... Um, go and live on Mars, all that sort of thing. So going and living on Mars, of course, is different from just visiting as well. Uh, right down, because it's nearly nine, right down on the bottom of this document, I've got uh, 
yeah, how to get hold of this work of the gods um, booklet. And again, if anyone else ever finds any websites on this type of thing, um, uh, then add them, add them into the, um, there'll be a document, an editable document um, that we can add website ideas as well because it would really be really good to um, build up much more of the kind of Maori view of the uh, stars and constellations and that sort of thing. So I think I'm done. Any more questions or comments? Um, Jenny, can I do a shameless plug for the Royal Society, Te Aparangi? Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Um, so you, uh, you're talking about light pollution, and that is definitely, as you said, a hot topic at the moment. And last week, um, the Royal Society released um, a, a summary of evidence on blue light. Um, and it looked at areas from how blue light affects our health, the environment, and also um, what we can see in the sky. And it's, it's written all in plain English, and it references tons of studies um, that are, you know, kind of good, good scientific studies to be able to use to kind of uh, start that debate with students um, about, you know, whether blue light is good or bad or, you know, what, how much damage is it actually doing to us looking at it at right. night so yeah so that's yeah. quite a good thing to reference and um also uh, another person to that's really good to follow is uh rangi matamua he does ah. living living with the stars um and it uh he if you follow him on facebook every monday night he does a kind of five to ten minute live facebook session where he talks specifically about something that's in the night sky at the moment and uh but only from a kind of Maori um, astronomy perspective, um, and he's wow, fantastic! Yeah, he's amazing. <laughs> Can so you I, send me that link, and um, I'll make sure it goes on the links document. Yeah, I will. I'll sure, put yeah. it on. I, I guess you you've got the emails of everyone too. We could all have that link. It just sounds amazing. Yeah, definitely. I'll put it on the the yeah. Dropbox um, suggestions thing. But yeah, he's he's really cool. Yeah. No, great. Uh, I, I've just found a simple way of, if I, I mean, I'm not school teaching, but if I, if I was, uh, I've just found on my computer anyway, I can put it onto night screen and my screen definitely goes yellower. And so you could actually show that to students to um, see if you might be able to switch it on so they can actually just see the difference between the screens or tell them that that's a function. On their computers because uh, particularly if you've got older students using a lot of computers um, or children doing children of your own doing stuff that if they you know often they have to do work late at night and if you if you've got to um, see if you can actually get an app or something or or see if it's in your settings somewhere where you can have it go onto a night screen yeah one so of the things that I, I found um, work for me when I was teaching um, a, a, a very multicultural class with lots of um, uh, folk from um, Asia and from um, well from yeah from China and also from India was um, the contribution of Chinese and Indians to um, astronomy and other sciences oh yes and, of course, and there's, yeah. a, there's a brilliant um, set of um, books by guy called Joseph Needham who wrote a history of his, his history of science in China which is a massive book that was um, about 20 volumes that he wrote between the two world wars and yeah. it shows the um, Chinese understanding of um, things like Halley's Comet um, the Chinese understanding of strata in rocks I know this is, uh, that's yeah. technology but wow. they understood the whole idea of um, deposition of layers of rocks centuries before the Western, Westerners did. And of course, you know, looking at other scientific things that the Chinese um, and the Indians invented, um, things like gunpowder and, and um, compasses and so on and so forth. So, you know, there is that contribution of all different cultures, you know. Yes, and I, I heard, an, uh, and also um, there was a, a PowerPoint going around at one stage among the physics community, because apparently, and I can't remember the exact amount of time ago, but I think it was even before the Greeks was Islamic culture, 
No, it can't have been. Anyway, I can't remember that when. But Islamic culture at one stage had these amazing astronomers, and so they could actually calculate total solar eclipses just from just from, ob, you know, from basically from observational. They didn't have all the, the means we have now. They didn't have telescopes and that sort of thing. But just from acutely observing the sky, they were able to calculate um, eclipses, which to me is absolutely amazing that they could actually do it. Another interesting story I heard was that the Chinese, and you can correct me if I've got this wrong, but the Chinese never had the observational stuff as strong, and they never developed a telescope because they never developed glass. And so therefore they never developed windows either. But what was really interesting was they never developed lenses. That's right, they never developed lenses because they never developed glass or their glass technology was never good enough to make lenses. Have you heard that? I didn't know that, but um, yeah. so with, that was regard, with regard to the Indians, um, when um, Josephine and I went through India coming to New Zealand, we went to, um, places like Jaipur and Agra, where they had yeah, I've been there. some yeah. Yeah. Um, ancient observatories. Amazing, aren't they? Yeah. yeah. They're incredible, yeah. 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 I know, that was really interesting about India, seeing that, that stuff. Yeah. And just, just to butt in quickly, the ancient Chinese astronomers were the only, is the only recorded evidence we found of humans witnessing um, a supernova with the naked eye. Um, so they, they were definitely doing some quite awesome observations. So they actually saw that happen because there was a, a, um, a supernova in 1986, I think it was, um, um, in, the, in the large Imaginella cloud, which um, I'm this, very... This one is the uh, Crab Nebula. Um, so yeah, it, that's... Yeah, it's, about a yeah. thousand years ago. Um, and it, it probably lots of people saw it, but the... the the ancient Chinese astronomers were the only ones that we found so far that have uh, recorded it. Um, and I don't know whether they, you know, were just particularly knowledgeable about the sky and knew that that was something quite special or what, but it's the only ones we've found anyway. Well, Albert Jones, who was a, who sadly is dead now, but it was, was an amateur astronomer, but with an international reputation. He, um, he was one of the discoverers of this, I see. And he, he basically went out, he, he knew the sky so well that he went out and looked up one day and said, you know, hello, 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 there shouldn't be a big star up there. <laughs> and I've always been very bitter and twisted. I'm not too sure what happened because I knew exactly where to look for that supernova. It was in the sky for about 11 days, apparently. I knew exactly where to look for some reason. I, I think I must have been on holiday and wasn't reading the newspapers. Oh, so disappointed that I didn't see that. <laughs> Wouldn't see that supernova. <laughs> yeah, well, the first well, ever photo of a supernova was taken by an amateur astronomer, I think, just last year. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, it would be wonderful to see an, 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 um, a supernova. It'd be incredible. Well, yeah. fingers crossed for Betelgeuse and Antares. <laughs> yes, that's right. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, mm. I'm certainly done. So. Well, thank you very much. That was, that was I wonderful. I it's been useful. I'm trying to give as many sort of ideas. Oh, there looks like a couple of other questions are there or? All oh, um, right. Okay. Just people leaving. Leaving. People saying thanks. Yeah. yeah. I'll um, get the recording of this and um, I'll make that available on the YouTube channel that we've got for these webinars and also I'll see if I can load it up to the um, Dropbox as well Okay, great. Yeah, all right. And uh, yeah, I do have another kind of big job going at the moment It's that time of the year when secondary teachers have big jobs and um, So or even X ones so but I will try and get that slowly get that uh, that other power I've actually got quite a few powerpoints that I could upload but I'll do one that specifically would be good with lots of stories on it but then I'll put some other ones that I've got that people are welcome to just take stuff from and use if they want to okay right thank you very much and um, shall we draw it to a close Janine that sounds good thank you so much okay. Jenny thanks a lot Jenny that was okay. wonderful and thank right. you everybody else for being taking part okay. Cheers. Good Thanks. night. Bye. 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 Good night.